So welcome everyone to Kate's Hour of Miracles. Um, generally I share around about the Course in Miracles teachings. Uh, I've occasionally shared from Ramana and a few other uh, uh, disappearance of the universe. Today I'm my talk is going to be around vigilance. Vigilance for God, vigilance for truth, vigilance for the atonement. And what I've done is I've, uh, there's a website called, if you don't know already about it, there's a website called thelittlegarden.org. I'll just double check that so that I get it right. Um, just got to check back here. Thelittlegarden.org. And if you go there, you can search through um, A Course in Miracles, workbook lessons and manual for teachers. And you can put a word in and you can search and come up with all the paragraphs that have that word in it. And it's really good if you're, say for example, you want to look up all the references to death or um, another word may be peaceful or anyway, whatever it is, if you've got a curiosity about all the different references to that word in the course, if it's a word that's used a lot, you'll get a lot of references. <laughs> and today what I've done is I've referenced the word vigilance and I'm going to just read out from my screen um, those references. So if you're watching me on the video, um, you'll see my eyes moving because I'm reading off my screen. I'm not reading from a book or anything, just a moment, I've just got to turn my heater down. It's going into winter here in Australia and it's, um, it's not bad, we don't, the winters are quite mild here, so it's, not, it's um, I think it's around about maybe 12, 14, that's degrees Celsius here in America, that's Fahrenheit. I don't know what it is in Fahrenheit because we've had metric here for all my life, so I don't, um, I can't convert, but anyway, it's a, it's a nice cool morning and it's a nice time to join you. If you're listening, I'm joining you. <laughs> Let's join in our minds. Let's join in our right minds, which is the Christ mind. And we all have the Christ mind in our mind. Just going to fix these. Um, this headphones up. So now let's invite the Holy Spirit in to our joining. So Holy Spirit, we invite you in today to be in charge. What we require of you through this time is the illumination of truth to our minds. We require illumination. We require the correction to anything that's not true in our minds. So during this time, Holy Spirit, I'm asking you to guide me with what I read and what I say and anyone that's listening in or watching the video back. Our prayer is for truth and only truth. So while we're joining, we're just keeping an open mind and we're asking the Holy Spirit to illuminate the truth that is in our mind. It's already there. We just have to remember it as we remove the blocks and be willing to become willing to have the blocks removed, which is the ego thought system of judgment and fear and guilt. All we have to do is notice those thoughts and give them to the Holy Spirit. We don't have to correct them. That's not our job. We can't actually correct them because we would only refer to the ego. <laughs> If we, because we, we don't know how to correct 
the ego. That's the Holy Spirit's job. So Holy Spirit, you correct all thoughts in my mind that are not your loving thoughts, your thoughts of oneness and wholeness and peace. So as we join today, illuminate the truth to our minds. We each have our own individual curriculum and Holy Spirit, will you will use all the symbols of this world to correct my thinking. So thank you and amen. Okay, so let me get onto my screen and okay, so I'm going to as I said before, the littlegarden.org and I have searched for the word vigilance. So what I'm going to do is I'll just read these out and if I feel to comment, I will. Maybe some of them I won't comment on because they might just speak for themselves. So the first time the word vigilance is used in the text, chapter 4, section 3, number 10. So I'll read out the references if you'd like to go back and read them for yourself if you haven't got um, or if you're just listening and you'd like to look at it in your book you've got there. I guess this is referencing the uh, Foundation of Inner Peace version. I'm not quite sure it doesn't have it here but I'm, I'm just taking a stab in the dark there. So this one reads, the calm being of God's kingdom, which is your sane mind, is perfectly conscious, is ruthlessly banished from the part of the mind the ego rules. The ego is desperate because it opposes literally invincible odds, whether you are asleep or awake. Consider how much vigilance you have been willing to exert to protect your ego and how little to protect your right mind. Who but the insane would undertake to believe what is not true and then protect this belief at the cost of truth? So I might just go through that again just to shine a little bit of light on that. Excuse me. <coughs> So the first sentence is the calm being of God's kingdom, which is your sane mind is perfectly conscious and is ruthlessly banished from the part of the mind that ego rules. So Jesus is talking about part of our mind which we can and have right now. We don't have to earn this mind. We've got it. We're completely awake and in this calm part of God's kingdom. And it is completely sane and it is perfectly conscious. And it is ruthlessly banished from the part of the mind that ego rules. So the way I look at the split mind is that we're in a, the ego mind is um, a mind that we're completely in. Generally, as we come into this world, we're in a mind that we're not even aware of, that there's another mind. So we're just in a mind. We're in a mind where its thought system is judgment, fear, comparison, competitive um, it's a it's a thought system that tells us we're a body it's a thought system that constantly refers to us as I it it brings in a self-concept it creates a self-concept the thought system creates an idea that there is a self there's a separate self and the thoughts are all about this separate self and and then it looks out and it talks about others. It says there's someone out there and then it sets up 
a whole thought system of um, attack that you it also that you're different they're different to you so this thought system is the ego mind and it's like a bubble you could say it's there's nothing in that bubble of the ego mind that is in the spirit's mind or the sane mind or the right mind or God's mind so the Holy Spirit's mind is like another bubble and these bubbles just don't meet these minds have got they're so different and they just do not meet at all so no part of the ego mind is in the Holy Spirit's mind and no part of the Holy Spirit's mind is in the ego's mind they're completely separate so that's why it's called a split mind and what happens when we first come to a course in miracles generally for for me I had no idea I had a split mind I had no idea I had another mind that I could live in I had no idea that this other mind had was more of an experience rather than a lot of thoughts it's its thoughts were actually just so gentle and so beautiful and so loving it's just an experience and a mind of thoughts of just perfect peace and actually it's it's thoughts of just how gorgeous everyone is and how beautiful everything is and how much it loves everything so because you're the holy spirit but the holy spirit's mind also corrects our misperceptions so it will correct the ego mind if you bring it to to the Holy Spirit so this first sentence is talking about the calmness of God's kingdom and he says in the course that peace is the goal of the course in miracles peace peace of mind complete peace so and it is a sane mind and this mind it sees very very differently to the ego and how do we get to this beautiful, sane, peaceful mind? Well, we just can't get there really quickly. We, we can get there quickly, but we have to. It talks about a tie, accepting the atonement, purification. It means all you have to do is be vigilant. That's why this talks about vigilance, because we have to be vigilant to bring every egoic thought to the Holy Spirit. So that's really what this vigilance is about. But Jesus puts it in lots of different ways. So he says the ego is desperate because it opposes literally invincible odds, whether you are asleep or awake. Now, what he's saying there, the ego knows, has a sense, that part of your mind has a sense that it's been corrected. So it opposes literally invincible odds. So, um, the invincible odds are that um, you are in God's mind and you have the Holy Spirit in your mind. That's the invincible odds. And it tries to oppose that. So it's a thought system that's completely opposite to truth. And it's completely false. So you've got one thought system that's completely true, which is the Holy Spirit's mind. And you've got the ego's mind. That is completely false and I love the Byron Katie work where it says um, uh, is it true and what I came to see one day when I was a few years ago I was working with her for questions it suddenly illuminated into my mind that one, not, not one thought I could have is true. Not one thought of the ego, I mean. God's thoughts are true. And it suddenly was like I had this huge illumination in my mind. Oh, my goodness. You know, I'm doing, I'm doing this, uh, these four questions. I'm doing the work on a thought or a few thoughts I was having. But in that moment, it was like the Holy Spirit illuminated something into my mind that not one thought is true of the egos. So this is why we're asleep when we believe it, when we believe we're separate. <coughs> <coughs> I 
third sentence of this is consider how much vigilance you have been willing to exert to protect your ego. So we're actually got vigilance to protect the ego, believe it or not. We are vigilant to protect our ego. And this is, this is um, there's a reason why, because we've forgotten God's mind. We've, we've gone into, a, we've actually just completely forgotten truth. And so what we know now is the ego's mind and we're literally scared of change. We're like, what will happen if I don't have this egoic mind? What will happen if I have no thoughts about a separate self? And that fear and, and the fear of trusting God and the fear of who we are. And so we have to really come to a place where we realise that we, that we um, he's asking us to consider how much vigilance <laughs> we're willing to exert the, to protect our ego. Um, we do a lot to protect the ego, but that's okay. All we need to do is notice that. We don't have to be uh, guilty. We just have to notice it. And how little to protect your right mind. So he's just asking us, you know, can you consider this? Can you consider the vigilance you are for your ego? Who but the insane would undertake to believe what is not true? So he's saying, who but the insane, which is every mind here that is in their ego is insane. That's literally, that's it. If you're in your ego mind, you are insane. That's what Jesus in A Course in Miracles tells us. We're actually insane. And we undertake to believe what is not true. And then protect this belief at the cost of truth. So while we're protecting the ego thought system, which is a belief system about it believes that others are different and should change, it's got a whole lot of beliefs about how unworthy we are. It tells us constantly, this ego thought system, it tells us that we're um, dirty and stained and that God doesn't love us. It tells us that uh, there's something wrong with us. Uh, its thought system is always there's something wrong with you. Everyone else is all right, but there's something wrong with you and you'll never find it. You'll never find this thing that's wrong with you because the ego says, go find that one thing and try to correct it and then you'll be okay. But this is the seek that do not find. That's why we try to find answers in fixing the body. You know, if we can change the body enough to be acceptable to other bodies in this world, we think that that's, that's why, you know, there's so much... Um, put into the ego, put so much into bodies and how it looks and um, how it speaks and how much intelligence and knowledge of things in this world. Everything is really idolised, these things, you know, how big your house is, how great your car is, uh, how great your job is, your job title, um, how, you know, your great memory. These are all idols. Um, and these are all beliefs. It's a belief system that if I can be a little bit better, a little bit thinner, a little bit prettier, a little bit uh, more intelligent, a little bit smarter, a little bit more beautiful, a little bit this or a little bit that, I'll be happy and people will like me then and I'll feel worthy. But all these thoughts come from a thought system that's telling you so this thought system tells you how unworthy you are. It really knocks you around because this constant thought system is you're not good enough, you're not worthy enough, there's something wrong with you. And that's so terrible to hear is that you cover it up and you try to find ways of being worthy. And that's the cost of truth by protecting that belief system, by being in that belief that thought system um, of, and it comes from guilt, but it's not experienced as guilt, is it? When you feel this deep unworthiness and we all have it, every single mind here in this world, an ego thought system, it's the one ego 
appearing as many. And it's all based on this deep, deep feeling of absolute unworthiness. And that's why it's so gorgeous to come to A Course in Miracles because if you went to a lot of churches, they'll tell you that you're a sinner <laughs> and you need to be saved. Um, and that just, that just makes you feel worse <laughs> because you're already feeling so bad and so unworthy. And it says if you do good works, you know, you'll be saved and you might go to heaven one day, one day when you die, you know. But this is just how the, um, you know, the ego has interpreted these teachings. Jesus is clear, non-dual teachings from the Bible. They've been interpreted by duality by a mind of duality and that's okay because he's here now in the course of miracles correcting it and that's why a lot of minds when they come to the course they just rejoice because here is the truth telling you you are the most beautiful thing i've ever seen you don't have to be worthy you don't even have to try to be worthy why would you try to be worthy when you were you know created absolutely perfect and whole and complete and then once we sink into that you know once we literally hear that message over and over again from jesus in his course he's just telling you you know we have to unwind from all these religious beliefs that we've especially the um the religious beliefs i'm not saying all churches do this because i'm i'm not a fay with well i'm saying that my church that i went to when I was younger, I got taught that. And um, so luckily, um, I, I had a radar for untruth <laughs> at that stage. And as much as I loved the teachings around Jesus, this beautiful man that had a beautiful mind, and he was so loving, I heard, loved all the stories about him going up to the lepers and just just washing people's feet and just how loving and gorgeous and beautiful, even though I didn't understand his teachings because those things that he said, I didn't quite get them because they were, I don't, for me, I'm just going on what I remember was I don't think that they were really explained that well. And it's not the fault of the ministers that were taught teaching it because if you go to a school and you're taught how to teach from the Bible, you have to be, they're vigilant for you teaching it in their way. Whereas here, luckily, we've just got a book. Um, we've got these words and they're bringing us home. They're bringing, they're telling us how much we're loved. They're telling us you are as God created you. They're not saying God created you in unworthy and now you have to work hard to be worthy. God created you as a sinner and you have to work hard to undo all this sin. <laughs> this is such good news, isn't it? And I think the, the Bible's called the good news or something like that. So this is good news. This is, you can't hear it enough. You can't hear it. You can't hear enough how gorgeous and beautiful and lovely you are, how you were created, and you are that. And if you just really sink into how amazingly beautiful and perfect and sinless and guiltless we all are, feel into that and just look out on your brother and see that in him. And it's what Jesus calls seeing the face of Christ. And as we see without, we feel it within. We see within. We're going to experience this. The more we can see the innocence everywhere, the more we're going to be brought back to the truth. So who would but the insane would undertake to believe what is not true? That's okay. We've done enough of that now. We've done enough of believing what is not true. We're coming into what is true, the truth about us. So the next readings from the text, uh, chapter 4, section 4, number 11. I do not attack your ego. <coughs> Hang on. <coughs> okay. I do not attack your ego. I do work with your higher mind, the home of the Holy Spirit, 
whether you are asleep or awake, just as your ego does with your lower mind, which is its home. So it's really, he's telling you that um, we have these two minds. He calls one the higher and one the lower, just probably because um, it's probably a good symbol for him, for us to start to, he's, he's, he's trying to use words that um, we can really understand that we've got this mind. And he says, I do not attack your ego. So he's never going to attack it. The Holy Spirit's never going to attack the ego. He's just, what it's going to do, oh, I'll read on. So I won't say it. I'll let him say it. <laughs> I am your vigilance in this because you are too confused to recognise your own hope. I am not mistaken. Your mind will elect to join with mine and together we are invincible. You and your brother will yet come together in my name and your sanity will be restored. I raised the dead by knowing that life is an eternal attribute of everything that the living God created. Why do you believe it is harder for me to inspire the dispirited or to stabilise the unstable? I do not believe that there is an order of difficulty and miracles. You do. I have called and you will answer. I understand that miracles are natural because they are expressions of love. My calling you is as natural as your answer and as inevitable. So he's just saying that he's going to, your mind will elect to join with mine and together we are invincible. So he's saying we just, um, we have to elect to join it. So we we just say, yes, join my mind. <laughs> There's one thing in the church that I do love is when they say, um, they say a blessing and it's been a few years since I've been to church. So it's something, may the mind of Christ be in your mind, which is really lovely. Um, and that's a really beautiful blessing. We do have the mind of Christ in our mind. We just it's just out of awareness. That's all. And we we're moving from this we're shifting away from this mind that's telling us how horrible and it's telling us how horrible we are, um, how guilty we are, it's just a thought system that's not true. But while we believe it, um, we're reacting to it, reacting as if it is true. So um, he's asking us to join him and that we're, that together we, were, we are invincible. You and your brother will yet come together in my name and your sanity will be restored. So he's talking about how he's going to use the relationships um, our relationships of brothers coming together and together in his name, which is just truth um, and sanity will be restored. So this sanity of the right mind or the one mind will be restored. And I love this next one. I raise the dead by knowing that life is an eternal attribute of everything that the living God created. So life... Um, Life is not a life here on this earth. It's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the life that we have in God's mind, which is eternal, it's the Holy Spirit's mind. So as we move into that mind and we have a revelation and we join with God, we start to um, have a knowing or an experience of this life. And it's... And it's um, because it's eternal, it's something that's in our minds. Um, and this is what the living God created because it is living. It's living in peace and love and joy. That's living. 
living is not living in an ego, it's fear mind. You can't live, you're never going to live and have peace and happiness, true happiness and peace while you're living in the ego mind. So let's move down <coughs> to the next one. <coughs> and this is chapter four, section five, number section one. <coughs> this is quite a popular little quote. He starts off with all things work together for good. There are no exceptions except in the ego's judgment. You hear that quite a lot, that, uh, that those two little sentences have been put together. Ain't in little memes. So that's, um, that is such an important quote. If you can remember this quote, it's very, very helpful. I used to write some of these out and put them on my wall, walls in my house because they're really good um, when, whenever you get anxious or depressed or, or just go out of peace. All things work together for good. So if you think things are working together for bad, <laughs> this will correct you straight away. All things work together for good. There are no exceptions except in the ego's judgment. So the reason why they work together for good is that there'll be lessons for you to wake up. Um, so the Holy Spirit will use all things um, that have happened to you in the past or happening now or going to happen in linear time to wake you up to the truth of a timeless mind, the holy instant, when there is no past or future. There's just this awareness of perfect oneness. So all things work together for good. So every time you have an upset or get angry or guilty or whatever, it's a lesson, it's working together for good. So the ego exerts maximal vigilance about what it permits into awareness and this is not the way a balanced mind holds together. The ego is thrown further off balance because it keeps its primary motivation from your awareness and raises control rather than sanity to predominance. The ego has every reason to do this according to the thought system which gave rise to it and which it serves. Sane judgment would inevitably judge against the ego and must be obliterated by the ego in the interest of its self-preservation. Well, there's a lot in there in that little paragraph. So let's just pick over this a little bit. The ego exerts maximal vigilance about what it permits into awareness. And this is not the way a balanced mind holds together. So the ego is going to make sure that you don't discover that its thought system is false. It doesn't want you to see or it's like um, the iceberg, a lot of it's underneath. It's going to, the ego will keep you looking for happiness in the world. It'll keep you interested in different idols. If, if you seem unhappy with one idol, it will bring another idol into your mind to chase, to seek, to exert effort to get that. It says that's where happiness is. And it it has its it has its own vigilance about what it permits into awareness so it keeps a lot of its um, thought system out of your awareness and this is not the way a balanced mind holds together of course not a balanced mind which is a sane mind sees it brings everything into awareness from that's from the ego and sees that it's false the ego is thrown further off, further off balance because it keeps its primary motivation from your awareness. Your primary motivation, its primary motivation, is to keep you believing in it and it keeps that happening because its deep thought system is based on separation 
um, is a lot of thoughts and unconscious beliefs in our in our egoic mind um, that we are completely unaware of. And this is why when we study the course and do the lessons that we start to um, uh, have um, periods of unsettlement because what's happening is a lot of these unconscious thoughts are coming up and um, its thought system is that we're guilty um, and that we're separate and that, we, that God hates us. And God's not interested in us. And it's thoughts, it doesn't want you to look at those thoughts because if you were to bring all those hidden thoughts, it's because it says Jesus is selling, telling us about the ego now and we need to know what it's doing so that we can get the Holy Spirit to help us because we've got to play a part in our, in our awakening we have to choose for the Holy Spirit. We have a decision maker. There's a part of our mind that becomes aware of the ego and it, and it, becomes a, it starts to become more of a witness to the thought system because where we are in the ego, we chose it and we are asleep that but we, we think that it is us. We think the thought system is who we are. And so it's saying that its primary motivation is to keep um, out of your awareness um, these thoughts. And so that's why it's so important to have, when we're studying the course, to have a lot of quiet time. It's really, really important. Um, a lot of the lessons are just, you know, talking about sitting quietness. Um, I would encourage you to not listen to the news, not listen to the radio, not read a newspaper for a certain amount of time. I dedicated two years to this. Um, you know, how much do you want peace of mind? What are you prepared to do for peace? Um, you know, it might take you 10 years to do this. It doesn't matter if it takes the rest of your life. It's... Um, this is what we, we're unaware of what the ego thought system is and it's, and it's keeping its primary motivation out of awareness. So we, we're, um, if you're busy and you're busy in your life and you don't have time to sit and really um, quieten your mind to become aware and ask the Holy Spirit to bring into awareness and raise it up, it's going to be it's going to be a lot um, longer for you to be have this peace. So we really need to have a big commitment into doing this and to raising these thoughts and to find what this primary motivation is. <clears throat> the ego has every reason to do this according to the thought system which gave rise to it and which it serves. So the the ego is literally a thought system of fear and guilt. So we need to get some distance about this thought system. Sane judgment would inevitably judge against the ego. So the sane judgment is the Holy Spirit's judgment. But for it to judge against the ego, um, this is our part. We have to be the decision maker. So, Holy Spirit, can you help me see this differently? All we have to do is be aware of when we've got a judgment, of when we've got a guilty thought, um, because we're going to be believing it. We're so asleep. We just get a thought, we believe it. We get a thought, we believe it. We act on it. We believe it. We get upset. We get another thought, we believe it. We act on it. This is what we do. This is the ego. We think the ego is us. We get another thought, we believe it, we act on it. We're literally a puppet. We're pulled around by the ego. The ego's controlling the strings. The only way we can ever be free of this ego thought system is to stop and be quiet and become more aware of what, what we're thinking and then become aware of it and give it to the Holy Spirit. 
So I'm going to go down next to the next one. <laughs> <coughs> this is chapter six. Section five, uh, sec um, number four. While the first step seemed to increase conflict and the second may still entail conflict to some extent, this step calls for consistent vigilance against it. Now, I don't know what those steps are. There must be something that's pre prior to this particular paragraph, so I can't refer to it because it's not on my screen. But he's asking, it must be something where we're taking steps. I have already told you that you can be as vigilant against the ego as for it. This lesson teaches not only that you can be, but that you must be. It does not concern itself with order of difficulty, but with clear cut priority for vigilance. So clear cut priority for vigilance. This is, this is why we, this is the atonement. How can you accept the atonement for yourself if you're not going to be vigilant for your thoughts? This lesson is unequivocal in that it teaches there must be no exceptions, although it does not deny that the temptation to make exceptions will occur. This is so important. Is, this is Jesus telling us that we cannot make exceptions with what we bring to her for the Holy Spirit to correct. We cannot hate one person and love another. We have to have all, every single bit of hatred, every single bit of judgment corrected. There's no exceptions, although he says you're going to be tempted to make exceptions. Here then, your consistency is called on despite chaos. So then I'm not sure exactly what he means by chaos, but he's probably just means your chaotic thinking. The ego is going to get vicious, believe me. <laughs> and so he's asking us to be consistent. Yes, we really do. And um, we just have to go through this. This is part of the awakening. You have to just be consistent with bringing everything to the Holy Spirit and the trust. Yet chaos and consistency cannot coexist for long since they are mutually exclusive. As long as you must be vigilant against anything, however, you are not recognising this mutual exclusiveness and still believe that you can choose either one. By teaching what to choose, the Holy Spirit will ultimately teach you that you need not choose at all. This will finally liberate your mind from choice and direct it towards creation within the kingdom. Um, <clears throat> as long as you must, you must be vigilant against anything. However, you are not recognising this mutual exclusiveness. So what he's saying that eventually... Um, if we realise that we have to be vigilant against anything, which is the ego, we are not recognising um, mutual exclusiveness, which is our one mind, and still believe that you can choose either one. So, the so what the way I would put that is, um, or sort of illuminate that. He says, and you still believe that you can choose either one. So in other words, we have to get to a state of mind where we really see that we think that we've got a choice between the ego and the Holy Spirit. And he's talking about that the ego isn't real, it's false. Um, and that we have to come to a particular place in our minds where we have to see that there is no choice. There will be some sort of illumination that there actually isn't a choice because there's only truth. You see, the ego's mind has to be seen as false and then the mind, our true mind, sees that there was really nothing to choose between because 
only truth is true. By teaching what to choose, the Holy Spirit will ultimately teach you that you need not choose at all. Um, so the Holy Spirit, first of all, teaches us what to choose, which is the thought system of love. And he'll ultimately teach you that you need not choose at all because he's, he says um, that he's shown you that there's nothing to choose between. This will finally liberate your mind from choice. So the liberation is talking about this enlightenment, liberation, finally liberate your mind from choice. So in other words, there's no choice because you're in God's mind. There's nothing to choose between. And direct it towards creation within the kingdom. Creation within the kingdom is God's mind and which is this beautiful, awakened, enlightened mind of God, which is peaceful, it sees wholeness, it sees oneness. And the creation is just um, the love and the, the song, I'll call it the song within the kingdom. And the kingdom of heaven is within you, it's in your mind. And creation in that sense has got nothing to do with form, it's to do with the love. and the love is between God and his son. So the song and the creation within the kingdom is the love expressed between the father and the son, which is just the song being sung of love and gratitude between the father and the son. And it's, a, it's an experience of this, just this beautiful love between Father, the Creator, and the Son. And these are words, this Father and Son, they're just words for um, something that's, you know, we give them words, but literally those words will fall away because you'll just be in love and this deep gratitude and nothing else will be in your mind besides that beautiful love. So I've got 10 more minutes. I'll just try to <clears throat> get one more section in. <coughs> this is uh, chapter 6, section 5, number 8. To teach the whole sonship without exception demonstrate, demonstrates that you perceive its wholeness and have learned that it is one. Now you must be vigilant to hold its oneness in your mind because if you let doubt enter, you will lose awareness of its wholeness and will be unable to teach it. The wholeness of the kingdom does not depend on your perception, but your awareness of its wholeness does. It is only your awareness that needs protection since, be since being cannot be assailed. Yet a real sense of being cannot be yours while you are doubtful of what you are. This is why vigilance is essential. Doubts about being must not enter your mind or you cannot know what you are with certainty. Certainty is of God for you. Vigilance is not necessary for truth, but it is necessary against illusions. <coughs> so he's really saying here that as a teacher, um, we are unable to teach um, anyone. We are unable to really be a teacher of God if we let doubt enter our mind about oneness. Our awareness of oneness, he says, heaven is the awareness of perfect oneness. That's such a beautiful, um, that's the way heaven is. It's not a place we go to, it's an awareness. So, it talks in the front of the course about the awareness of love's presence, which is another way of saying the kingdom of heaven. He, um, everything he's talking about is not something we go to when we die. It's awareness now. We can have the awareness of heaven right now. Um, the wholeness of the kingdom does not depend on your perception, but your awareness of its whole. But, it's, but your awareness of its wholeness does. 
it's your awareness that needs protection. Um, so we have to become, um, he, I love this, that he always used the words awareness. He doesn't use the word consciousness. A lot of other paths use the word consciousness, but he defines this awareness um, which is just in your mind. So in your mind, you're aware of wherever you're sitting, that's awareness. Um, you be, have to become aware of your thoughts. And so he's using this word awareness to, um, for you to become aware of things, aware um, of your thought system, aware of how you're thinking and so we eventually get to the awareness um, of oneness and wholeness to teach the whole sonship without exception, which means um, that you perceive its wholeness. So it means that when we, wherever we are, whoever we meet, wherever we meet them, we're going to be teaching without exception that you're perceiving its wholeness. And that's how we teach. That's the only thing we can ever teach is what we're aware of and, and have learned that it is one. So, you, so when I had the uh, awakening, what you would call an awakening, which is just a, a word, um, it's not special because we're all, because you have the same mind as me, you have the same mind as Christ. It's not special to have this mind. It's normal. It's natural. Um, let's not give it no specialness. It's just the most natural thing in the world to be aware of oneness. So um, what happens is there's something that's illuminated in our minds that becomes aware that everything is one. Even though the eyes still see what seem to be separate things, you have a, the mind has now entered into another um, area which is where the ego mind that bubble you're not in there you've moved over to the bubble of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit only perceives or aware of oneness so and it that's knowledge knowledge is truth and knowledge is in your mind right now and he's saying here we have to be vigilant to hold its oneness in our minds because if we let any doubt enter we're going to lose awareness of its wholeness and then we can't teach it so this is um so even when we become aware of oneness which we will uh as we accept the atonement uh, the holy spirit the right mind corrects all the wrong-minded thinking we will um eventually there'll be an illumination into our mind um, and we'll see everything differently. We'll, we'll see the real world, which is oneness, which is a unified perception. There's many words for it, but it's, it's a different experience. It's true vision and you won't be able to see any other way. You'll know that everything's one. You'll know. This is knowledge. You'll know that everyone is the Christ. You'll know that every living thing, every living thing is holy. Um, you'll see the absolute beauty of everything, that everything will be new and fresh because every brother you meet will just be the most beautiful person you've ever met. It's like, you know, literally if you can think of meeting Jesus, um, every time you meet your brother or an animal or anything, a leaf on a tree, it's the most amazing thing. It's the Christ. It's the holiness your mind's perceiving truly. It's, um, it's, it's, a just, it's just gorgeous. It's just light-filled and peaceful and there's no thoughts of fear because you're completely, um, you're just not associating or identifying as a body. The only way uh, to be free into this mind of love, this mind, mind of God is to completely undo all these ideas about being a body. That's why there's so many lessons in the course that I am not a body, I am spirit. I am as God created me. We will 
really come to an experience, will have a revelation, even a small glimpse is going to show you what's, what is truth. So we can then really know, we can have this knowledge. And it says that is why vigilance is essential. Doubts about being, which is about be who we are, being, who I am, sometimes they can't be described you know we can put words to who we are but once you've got an experience of that um, that's all that matters because you'll just know you'll know who you are and you'll know who everyone else is and you'll know that nothing that who you are is eternal and infinite and it's got nothing to do with being a body and this body is just will be is a communication device it's going to be something like it is now for me, just a communication device to communicate this message. And that's it. It's all it's for, some hugs, some kisses and some loving words to my brother. <laughs> so I'm going to now move away from my screen and back to, um, it's getting on to the hour. So I'll give you a blessing. So thank you for joining me. And I hope you enjoyed reading uh, along with me about vigilance and how we need to be vigilant for our uh, for God and his kingdom and be vigilant for any thought that's not of love. And we need to be vigilant to bring it to the Holy Spirit, bring it to Jesus and have it corrected and hold, you know, he says, come to God with empty hands. So we can't bring any thought. We don't squeeze through that eye of the needle with a the fearful or a guilty thought so thank you and i love you and i bless you and i honor you and thanks for joining and i'll just finish this